Charlie. Charlie, welcome. 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 welcome, welcome. Yes. Thank you so have... much. I'm very sorry about the technical issues we had. So I'm very happy to participate here. Am I allowed to talk? Please. Uh, please go ahead, Ralf. Introduce yourself and and let us know what is your what is your perspective on uh, multimodality. Thank you very much, uh, Max. And uh, sorry again. So my name is Ralf Charlie Schulz. I'm the president of the UIRR. We are the industry association for combined transport in Europe, and our members are the CT operators and the terminal managers. And I just had my general assembly today and we refocused our strategy on the European Green Deal because the clearly articulated objective for Europe, the 55% CO2 reduction by 2030 and the full carbon neutrality by 2050, um, we think that one of the best solutions to achieve these goals is combined transport. That's why. Our new vision today is zero carbon emission combined transport as the solution for well performing longer distance surface freight logistics in a carbon neutral Europe. So you came with your webinar exactly on the right time. And what is important to mention, uh, I think a lot of things have been already mentioned by Idris and by Josef. Um, we are looking for a CT, which stands for Environmental, Social and Economic Sustainability. And the three top elements to improve the attractiveness of CT will be an adequate infrastructure capacity for freight, will be a technical interoperability and a level playing field. Concerning the adequate infrastructure capacity for freight, it's important to have quality train paths for freight trains, to have capacity allocation based on greatest social benefit principle and the traffic priority to whichever train is on time. What we have to always bear in mind is that bad quality is the biggest capacity killer. The second point is a technical interoperability. Of course, ERA is dealing with safety and interoperability, so this is really something you're dealing with on a daily basis. We need a uniform loading gauge, so the four meter clearance on every line is crucial. P400 for trailers everywhere where it's possible on the whole ecosystem, on the whole network. We need 740 meter long trains throughout the network, also in the terminals, because otherwise you will lose the productivity you gain with longer trains in the terminals. So please. We need to t think about the terminals and the infrastructure in the terminals is also crucial. And of course, these 740 meter long trains have to have 200,000 ton gross weight and 22.5 ton axle load. And of course, the electrification of every line used by freight trains is a must. The third point, the level playing field, is about the infrastructure charging, the discounts and the markups on an equal footing about the energy taxation based on energy and carbon content, and of course the CT directive, which um, is going, when, once it will be amended, uh, taking into account also the external costs. So the European mindset that was mentioned, the green logistics chain, the trimodal strategy, the tendering process in a multimodal way for the shippers, and all the missing links, these are the topics we have to work on, and this is where we are convinced that combined transport is the best possible solution. Thank you. A very strong statement. And we have uh, conditions of fairness, better infrastructure. What about standardization? For example, standardized maritime containers. How do we get those on trains? And how, how do you rate the level of interaction on such issues between the different sectors, road, rail and maritime? For me, it's important that uh, all the modes are interlinked and that the standard is not a silo mode, uni-mode uni thinking, but that when we talk about standardization, it is for the whole transversal chain, including maritime, including waterways, including yeah. all the possibilities yeah. that on the standardization issue, of course, 
everybody is a bit looking today on this side, but uh, if at least the uh, loading units and, and the wagons uh, could be more standardized, it would help already. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so I think we will have more questions directed towards you. Um, I, I want at this point to open the floor to, to all the questions from, from our audience. Um, I will uh, I will start with a question on noise. Um, one of our audience members is worried that if too much traffic is shifted to rail, the noise levels will increase accordingly. And uh, what can we do about that? Idris Joseph, what do you think? Well, uh, Max, if you want me to reply, I believe, uh, first of all, we need to clarify that, of course, uh, the specific noise emissions of road are not zero, and it is not that uh, by shifting from road to rail, we would uh, drastically increase uh, the noise emissions. However, on the other hand, uh, we have a program in place that also follows directly from uh, the TSI noise to uh, make the freight wagons silent, uh, for instance, with composite brake blocks. In uh, some countries, uh, this is already effectively in place, Switzerland uh, first and foremost, but uh, also in some other Central European countries. But it is absolutely clear that we also need to manage the noise impact on our population. Yeah, I want to give this also to our uh, co-panelist, uh, Kate. From your perspective, what uh, does uh, what role does noise play in your strategies? Are you worried about uh, noise created by increased use of railways? Uh, well, in in the port, do you understand? I, are you, I am. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. We hear you loud and clear. Thank okay. you, Kate. Okay. Um, well, in fact, um, we are a port area, and there uh, it's an industrial um, uh, place, so it's not such a problem. Uh, but um, on some spots, it might be, it might be when uh, traffic is growing, and but we don't know. We are, we cannot, um, as a port authority, we don't know, yeah, yet uh, what, uh, what, um, yeah. The impact. Uh, we, we are not looking for that. In fact, uh, not yet. We are mm. talking to Infrabel yeah. um, to see yeah. what will be the effect if uh, more trains um, day and night will pass that specific city or, or little um, village. Uh, will it will it be a problem or not? We yeah. further than that, we are not involved. In fact, not at this moment. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well understood. Thank you. And and Ralf Charlie, uh, is, is noise a factor for combined transport? I think it's a huge issue, and uh, mainly on the on the Rhine Valley, we had a lot of uh, complaints uh, about the noise. But it is being uh, solved at least partly with the retrofitting of uh, the wagons and retrofitting of the brakes. So uh, it's mainly a brake issue, and I think this is going to be settled. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I see here in the um, in the chat that we have uh, a lot of approval, seven likes for uh, Euro control Euro control for rail concept. Um, it should be created as an European level entity above the national infrastructure managers in order to support the circulation of passenger and freight trains across the continent. It will enhance and create a better performance. Yeah, Joseph, we can simply just agree with that statement? Well, uh, I think it is extremely important that rail is a performant transport system. Kate mentioned the ports as a major entry point of freight into Europe, but we need to distribute that freight uh, to the final destination. 
So we need to make sure that this works reliably and this works efficiently. Unfortunately, now we have no real coordination. So when you are in Belgium, then coordination with France or with Germany is lacking. And therefore we lose a lot of time. We lose a lot of predictability. We lose a lot of efficiency. Charlie mm -hmm. mentioned the 740 meter trains. He mentioned the 2000 ton trains. Uh, he mentioned also the 22.5 tons axle load. But the coordination, the cross border coordination is extremely important. We have already in some member states, uh, Germany, there is uh, the click and right, yeah, but this is only for one country. We need the same principle for the whole of Europe. Mm -hmm. Charlie, would you agree with that statement? If, if I may, uh, what is important is to have a collaborative decision making like the airlines have. And uh, we are together with the Commission working on a study on exactly this collaborative decision making in order to have uh, certain central functions so another layer on top of what is there with the infrastructure managers today. And this will, of course, help because collaboration between the member states will be absolutely crucial. So mm -hmm. uh, it exists in the air. Of course, you cannot transpose it one to one to rail. But the idea behind to have this collaborative decision making is exactly the direction we have to follow. We have here a kind of sub question to the Euro control issue. Um, when discussing Euro control and studies for bottlenecks, have you considered to use the elements of TTR plan to be implemented for timetable year 2025? These include capacity strategy and capacity models jointly harmonized by infrastructure managers, managers um, that should also identify, identify capacity bottlenecks. Does that sound like an interesting idea? Well, uh, we are, of course, uh, well aware of what is going on uh, with the timetable uh, redesign. Uh, but as uh, Charlie just said, uh, the idea of a uh, Euro control for rail goes beyond uh, that uh, planning aspect. Of course, the planning aspect will be an essential input, but it will be the collaborative decision making and it will also be the fast reaction time. Yeah, because mm -hmm. one of the issues that we have in rail is that rail is not very reactive and uh, this needs to be changed. Uh, we remember, for instance, that a couple of weeks back there was a huge hyper container vessel stranded in the Suez Channel and this uh, resulted in a huge overload of uh, the ports, but what I could read in the press that uh, the ports in order to uh, work up the backlog had to resort to road because rail was not reactive enough. And this is what we have to change. Mm -hmm. So what, what we need, if I may, Max, if I may, Please, uh, yes. what we need is contingency plans that are really working, international contingency plans. We had the last incident after Rastatt some years ago last incident on the Rhine Valley in Kestet and we saw that it took really a long time before the reaction were there and you can have the best planning with TTR. You also need to be able to react on situations and that's why contingency management, the cross-border mm -hmm. contingency management for me is very important and uh, unfortunately for the Kestet case, uh, the International Contingency Handbook was not taken because there was not enough volume, but you have to be flexible and creative here and uh, sometimes also uh, dare to do things that are not completely orthodox. For example, what we said is would you have uh, shortened a little bit the passenger traffic, the regional one on that uh, link on the uh, right bank side of the Rhine, then uh, at the end of the day you could have run more freight trains and this was 200 a day uh, through the other bank of the Rhine. But of course, uh, this needs uh, flexibility and contingency management. Mm -hmm. Kate, I, I would imagine you, you could agree with that. Flexibility and uh, efficiency. 
Uh, yes, but um, I'm not very uh, involved in uh, in those things. As a port authority, uh, we try to help our terminals to get the infrastructure right and to yeah to have the flexibility and in the port. But outside the port, it's very uh, difficult for us to to find out and to see how everything is working. We only know small things about that, and we are only involved, like for example, in the rail freight corridors and um, mm. for me that is the um, that is the place where where that is the group of people who yeah. are working on uh, such things but yeah that's yeah. all you you are, you are happy with if those seven kilometers between Belgium and the Netherlands are opened up. Well, but that, that's an in, intra-port uh, infrastructure thing. And yeah, we count a bit on, on you and on uh, all those parties to do the rest of the traject uh, outside. <laughs> we, we have to stay within our boundaries. Right. Thank you. Um, I, I want to turn uh, to a question by Bernd Schittenhelm. Uh, who um, got five likes for asking speed of technology development is by far higher within the road sector, batteries and autonomous vehicles, as an example. How can the technology development for railways be speeded up? Joseph. Well, uh, I believe we have to distinguish two elements. The one is the speed of technology development and the other one is how can such technologies uh, be deployed. Uh, there we have the difficulty of rail, that rail is a shared system where a locomotive uh, needs to run across Europe and needs to be interoperable. So we cannot uh, simply change in one country to a new technology without uh, considering the effect uh, on the total system. But uh, exactly for that reason, we have the European joint undertaking shift to rail, which was created in order to speed up innovation. And we have now in the making, and uh, hopefully it will start uh, still this year, the new Europe's rail joint undertaking, which will include the concept of a system pillar, which is also intended uh, to speed up uh, the innovation uptake. But I would once more uh, also bring the attention back that all these technologies, battery trucks, uh, electrified trucks, take some time to be developed and to be deployed. The rail solutions are here today the combined transport is here today. We just need to create the framework and the political will to apply them. So innovation is important, but innovation is not the only angle that we should pursue. Yes, we should not lose sight of reality. And uh, in connotation with that, we have here a question by Mr. Valenti from Fermet. Welcome. And he got six likes for asking, does somebody know how many additional freight wagons will be needed by 2030 if the share of rail transport increases until uh, by 30 percent until that time? And how many are there at present? Well, does anybody know this? We know that uh, at the moment there are around uh, 800 freight wagons uh, in Europe, but uh, we need to do several things uh, at the same time because we need to increase the speed. And uh, if a freight train, instead of uh, running four days, uh, can do the same uh, distance in two days, uh, we not only double the capacity, we also double the utilization of the assets meaning actually we could double the capacity without having a single additional wagon. So it's a bit more complicated than just saying if I increase the volume by 50%, I need 50% more wagons. If the proper organizational measures are taken, if 
and we come back to Europe control for rail, if the capacity is managed adequately, we will also get better asset utilization. Another um, technical problem that we have right now is that many truck trailers, it's an anonymous question, are not equipped for crane use. And that means that it's not possible to move the trailers from truck to rail. Uh, what is planned for this at all in the future and uh, for existing trailers equipped with the appropriate provision? Ralf, Charlie, do you know? Well, uh, uh, we lost you again. Okay, yeah. I'm afraid we lost Charlie, but I yeah. could imagine what he would have answered. Uh, yeah. As we stated before, there is a huge potential for combined transport for the trailers. Uh, about three quarters of the road freight is uh, those trailers. And now uh, Charlie is back and he can certainly tell us that the effort needed for making such trailers trainable is very limited. Charlie, are you back? I'm back. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. There was a question about uh, the trailers. Uh, why are so many trailers not yet craneable and how can we make these uh, trailers craneable? I will answer to this immediately, but please allow me to just react on the other two questions. The first one uh, was about technology because technology for me per se is nice is a nice to have is not a goal as such technology must uh, lead to a goal must lead must help achieving something and helping efficiency and uh, productivity and in order to achieve the zero carbon emission combined transport of course we have to have a zero carbon emission on the first mile on the last mile on the long haul on the rail and also in the terminals so we have to see the whole logistics chain. This is one important point. And uh, there are a lot of uh, interesting technologies on the road, um, also making uh, trucks greener. But I must say that a, a green truck, uh, be it 100% green, is not as good as 40 trucks on a train. So you also have to uh, analyze the uh, effects that you have from steel on steel versus rubber on asphalt. So only technology uh, to make it greener as such is not enough. And of course, uh, we always say for combined transport that the trucks, you have to utilize them for the first mile and the last mile for the short distances. But if there are more sustainable alternatives um, to the road on the rail or uh, inland waterway or short sea, then please let's try to use these alternatives. So technology is very important and uh, if we have uh, hydrogen trucks or at least the greener trucks than today for the first and last mile, uh, they are more than welcome. Uh, the second point on the wagon, I think uh, uh, Josef uh, answered perfectly well. Um, we know the number of wagons we have today, but it's not enough, the number of wagons. You always have to bear in mind that uh, today uh, intermodal is 50% of rail freight, but if you want to double rail freight in 10 years, then we have to triple combined transport. And this ratio has to be uh, seen as well. Concerning the craneability of trailers, um, there is a big discussion mainly in Germany. There's a round table with the ministry which discusses the issue of craneability. Uh, of course, uh, the arguments against trainability are always costs and weight. So, of course, the equipment to make the trailer trainable costs some money and it is a bit um, uh, heavier than uh, the normal trailer. Uh, but, of course, if you have the production in theory, this can mitigate this issue. The reason why you don't have more trainable trailers for the moment being is mainly because you have to understand that only 5% of the trailers are trainable today. Those companies who have in their strategy have trainable trailers, they invest only in trainable trailers. They don't know anything else. 
that all the smaller companies, the smaller transport companies having one or two uh, trailers themselves uh, with the uh, machine, they fear today uh, to put it on the train because they would need a partner on the other side. And uh, they don't want to uh, disconnect the uh, tractor from the trailer. This is one of the main reasons, but okay. uh, the, the study performed by the European Commission and uh, this will give us more information about where we are standing with all the horizontal technologies uh, that also mm -hmm. can help. So everything helping motor shifts is positive. Um, the craneability itself as a standard is not yet there and uh, that's why it's uh, individually decided whether they are craneable or not. My understanding is craneability as a standard, uh, like the security belt in the car, would help, but it's even not enough. Thank you, Charlie. I read a similar um, comment in the chat now by um, Eric Lambert from the CFL. Um, but uh, as we have only time for two or three more questions, I want to uh, go through the top rated question that we have right now. Uh, one is from Colin W. Currently, there are multiple concepts for combined transport, road and rail, where the trailers are directly driven onto the wagon, like cargo beam or law, etc. Would it be sensible to work towards a standardized system throughout Europe? Or would it be more beneficial to work towards more utilization of ISO containers that can be easily transferred from truck to rail? Charlie. If you want me to answer this question, yes. it's very easy. Uh, the trailer itself is not the ideal intermodal loading unit because you have uh, supplementary weights to the wheels on the trailer. So per se, it's not the ideal intermodal unit. A container or swap body which would be much better. But the market demands the trailer because it gives the market flexibility so that at the end, the trailers will continue to be there and you have to find the best possible ways to shift the trailers from the road to the rail. And here I, again, all modes that are possible are good. So all the horizontal modes like Modalor, like Cargo Beamer, even uh, the ones that help um, like Nikrasa uh, are positive because they help the modal shift. Uh, a unified standard does not exist. The only standard which we have today is the craneable uh, trailer. Uh, when you make him craneable, because this can be used like a container or a swap body in almost every uh, terminal. But it will be an issue to work on this, what the best solution will be. Let's wait the study of the Commission, which is about uh, analyzing the different technologies. For the moment being, there is no standard, but every system that you have has um, a good right to be there, because if it helps, it's good. So the compatibility between road and rail is here crucial. Mm -hmm. Is there anybody else want to pick up on well, that? Just to add, Max, uh, that we will clearly have different market systems, uh, segments, uh, even uh, for the ports uh, where the maritime logistics uh, relies very heavily on the standardized containers. Not all the goods are containerized. And uh, here for the land transport, the game is road versus rail. Clearly for the ship to rail uh, transport chain, the standard containers will play a key role. But for many other currently road oriented transports, the answer is in the craneable trailers. Uh, in the slide that I showed at the beginning during my intervention, I indicated that uh, every road transport for distances longer than 700 kilometer should actually be moved on rail. There is no reason for a lorry to run across Europe for 1,000 kilometers, 2,000 kilometers even. Those should be put on a train and the easiest way to put those uh, goods on train is via the craneable trailer. 100% in agreement. 
Um, I want to move to a different topic. Uh, we don't have much time left, but I still want to allow two questions as we have so many and thank you for for supplying those. Um, one is about P400 should be a new 10T parameter in order to foster modal shift from road to rail. But this should be supported by EU regulation in order to forbid road transit and by infra investment to support infra manager and member states to be upgraded to this level. Who wants to take this up? What, what we are trying to, if I may, what we are trying to is to integrate this as one of the parameters of the 10T corridors, so of the core network corridors. And uh, if it is a standard, then it's much easier uh, to be rolled out all over Europe. But the necessity is there, uh, and this is independent of the horizontal or the vertical transshipment. Uh, we need P400 for the trailers everywhere where it's possible. So the codification of uh, the lines should change that direction, and this should be in the new regulation of the 10T guidelines. And uh, just to uh, fit in one final question, how does ERA consider the standardization of data exchange between partners in the rail sector and its customers? And what role does ERA want to play in this? Well, that's one for you, Joseph. Again, we spoke a lot about the physical standardization, and I just would like to underline that uh, Charlie is absolutely right. We need to have harmonized physical conditions in Europe. Currently, there is not a single corridor where we can run 740 meter trains end to end. We do not have 22.5 tons. We do not have a single corridor that is fully fitted with EFMS. So this is the physical dimension. But for having a multimodal logistics chain, we need also the data interoperability. We need the data exchange. And we have currently some pilots going on in the agency on data governance and on data interoperability. But this is also the basic if we would ever want to progress towards a euro control for rail, the data integration will be key. Thank you, Joseph. Um, I'm afraid that today it's always uh, a pity. Uh, maybe we should uh, organize two hours webinars, but then people get very tired uh, after such a long time. Um, in any case, uh, a wholehearted thank you to all panelists, our own speakers, and of course you, the audience. Um, I'm showing you here the uh, results of our uh, survey. We had more than 100, we had 113 votes overall. You can see here multimodality in zero low emission are the clear winners of this uh, grid of possible answers, but uh, modernization through technology data integration, putting customer first uh, and fair conditions are also up there. The holistic view of finance and safety, I think Idris people will have to read the report <laughs> to our report to, to put this further up. Um, may I give uh, the floor to uh, Joseph for some final words? And then I have a few final comments on uh, on our next webinars, please, Joseph. Well, many thanks, Max, and uh, many thanks to the panelists, uh, Kate and uh, Ralph Charlie, to uh, Sarah and Idris uh, for their presentation. But uh, I would also appreciate all participants for their pertinent questions. I believe it was a very lively debate. Once more, we have seen the huge potential that uh, rail freight can provide in order to achieve the objectives of the Green Deal. Carbon neutrality by 2050 is a challenge. Uh, we are just showing the strategy uh, that uh, brings together several elements, how rail uh, can contribute. Uh, we have the report, the part two of our report on the rail contribution to the European Green Deal ready. It will be made available immediately after this webinar. 
can be downloaded from uh, our web page. And of course, we would uh, like to welcome any feedback you might have on our report because the work uh, will still have to continue. We will have to prepare several uh, legal acts over the next couple of years. Uh, we need to prepare several policies and we need to move forward towards shifting more freight to rail. I see that Max is muted. Max, you need to unmute. Yeah. Um, so sorry for this. Um, thank you very much, uh, Joseph. And um, I just uh, want to draw your attention before we go um, to our next webinars that we have upcoming. And the 3rd of June, we have a webinar on post-pandemic recovery of railways. On the 7th of June, we have maintenance of railway vehicles, what's new and what you need to know. Do not hesitate to continue sending us your questions by using the link provided on this event webpage. Um, we will do our best to uh, answer all your questions even after this webinar. So uh, check out for this the event webpage again and you might find an answer to this um, as far as reasonably be possible. Um, we would also be very happy to receive your feedback on this webinar. So we have the link provided on the webinar webpage on the ERA website. And um, if you would like to stay updated on our activities, please sign in to our database by selecting the button My ERA Profile that you find on our homepage uh, on the top or on the bottom. Uh, all that is left for me is to thank you all for participating and we wish you a pleasant afternoon. Take care and stay safe. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye. Thank you.